welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. All you who registered and a few gate crashers, we're happy to have you. I'm Kathy Weiland and I'm the Matamidi Community Education Director and we're just delighted to host this event. Uh, part of my job is to thank some people and to let you know the restrooms are out there to the right. And um, I want to thank uh, the people who, people who helped this get going. Uh, Tara's here from White Bear Lake Area Schools. We've got a couple of school board members here. Julie's over there. Kevin's over there. Kevin's, Kevin was on our committee. Our superintendent, Barb Dufferin's over there. Um, I want to thank Jim Lane. He's a high school life science teacher. You'll hear from him later. I want to thank Rob um, Thomas, and he also made the fry bread this morning, so it was delicious. That's worth a round of applause. And I want to thank Sarah from the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society and Jordan from White Bear Lake Area Schools. Um, I want to mention a few things that are on your table. The program, you can see, this is what's coming up in this series, so check that out. This is shameless propaganda from Matamidi Community Ed. We, we got you over here today. We'd love to have you, have you come again. So these, a lot of these activities you can register starting in January. And then there's um, Why Treaties Matter. That's uh, another program that's associated with what we're doing here. This four page, 12 page, 300 page thing <laughs> that Rob put together, he'll mention. And, and then there's uh, the holiday community conversation feast. Um, so that's all the stuff on the table. And I want to hand it over to Jordan, who will take care of our blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. My name is Jordan Zickerman, and I am the Indian Education Program Lead at White Bear Lake Area Schools. And today, I would like to start by blessing our space. And we were going to smudge in the beginning. Change of plans. If you would like to be smudged as you leave the space, I will be right outside the doors. So feel free. Today, we give thanks to the Creator for what we have been given. We give thanks for the sky above and the earth below, the rising sun and the moon. We give thanks for the beauty in our surroundings and for our growing diverse community. We give thanks to our parents, brothers, sisters, friends, and the laughter of our children. We give thanks for the love in our hearts. Creator, may you bless this space and continue to bless our community while looking over us. Miigwech. Credit has become so associated with Native Americans, and of course it's not a traditional food because Native Americans traditionally didn't use flour. Uh, but why uh, is it so associated with Native Americans? And one of my aunties told me that uh, when reservations started receiving commodities uh, that they distributed to their tribal members, uh, usually surplus food left over uh, from feeding the branches of military, uh, they had to figure out what to do with all of that. So every ingredient uh, in your fry bread this morning was at one point something that would come in a commodity box. So there's a flour in there, uh, there's shortening or what they would get big blocks of lard, uh, there's powdered milk in there, uh, water of course. So all of these ingredients came from commodity products uh, and they figured out what to do with them and they turned into this delicious fry bread which is not traditional but now Every event you go to, you can probably find yourself a, a fry bread taco or fry breads. Uh, so we just wanted to give a little, we wanted to say it's not a long tradition <laughs> history, but it is a recent tradition and it is, and that's why it's associated with that. It's an honor to be here today uh, to have this session. We're thrilled that when we proposed these, uh, this series of sessions that we had a good response. So we did one uh, evening program that was similar to this at the White Bear, uh, White Bear Lake District Center and now today we are here uh, at the Matamidi District Center and it's fun to have um, have a big crowd. So thank you all for being here and, and joining us. Uh, so essentially what we, what we hope to accomplish through this, these sessions, or through today anyway, uh, is an honoring of our legacy as a community, a recognition of our past, and the various and complex interactions that have and still play a role in who we are as a larger group. We approach this work with an attitude of respect and humility. There's much to be learned from our past for each of us. 
Today's session is intended to be a starting point, just like all of them, uh, both taking us back as far as we can with the story of our land and the human inhabitants of our area and bringing that impact forward to today. So it's not, it's, it's a place for us to start and tell the story and, and we'll hear um, pieces of the land itself from Jim Lane with the tree cookie that we'll be discussing that um, is, is a phenomenal artifact in its own right uh, and stories of the people and the impact of the people on our land uh, and carry that forward but it's not an ending point it's not a we've told that story now we're finished it, we will be carrying these stories through all of these series as we go so uh, <clears throat> So with each session, we will add more layers and attempt to bring that collective story further into the present. The Wiper Lake Area Historical Society, as I mentioned, has coordinated these presentations to lay the groundwork for the, the conversations and, and uh, the series to continue. And as the executive director, I am equipped to share from the historical perspective uh, and have the honor of being joined, as I mentioned, by members of our community who can share from their own personal perspectives on our past as examples of the varied and complex experiences and resources that make up our community. One of the things that we really want to point out and talk about today and, and throughout these is that every individual story is unique. The story of a group, whether it is defined by ethnicity, religion, citizenship, race, or another label, is made up of individual stories of the members of that group. So your story will be very different from your story, even though there are similarities, or my story would be different from the story of my parents or my siblings, although we have common ground, if you will. Um, we all have individual experiences and pieces that piece those together. And that is the same for any larger group that we look at. So not one story, well, not one version can tell the story of, of any any piece. So as such, uh, this three-part series, because we have two other continuing in the winter and the, and the spring, uh, will touch on examples of stories from our area over the centuries, beginning today with the Dakota and the Ojibwe, and continuing this winter with the largely European-based immigrants who came in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and followed next spring with the post-World War II population surge with more recent, the more recent arrivals, primarily from Southeast Asia, Mexico, and Central America. So my background and training is in historical research. I tend to, for those who are familiar with me, I tend to love to dive into documents and photographs and things like that. When you start looking at the Dakota and Ojibwe history of Minnesota in particular, there are resources, absolutely, but not that go back far enough as far as I'm concerned um, from a written standpoint or from a document standpoint. Uh, and so it's difficult to dig deeply in some of those cases. It's interesting because um, one of the things that uh, we get to do today is, with the tree cookie is talk about what the land itself, how it's speaking to us. And so we will jump into that. One of the other clues or one of the other pieces that helps us inform us on the impact that the early peoples of Minnesota um, have had on this community or this area are the place names. And so up here, you're not meant to be able to read the map, so don't panic. Uh, <laughs> but up here we have uh, a map of the hydrographical basin of the upper Mississippi by Joseph Nicollet. Now this is one of the earliest maps of this area that is Minnesota. You can see Lake Superior up here, um, the Mississippi River, and other areas. Uh, of course, this is pre-Minnesota. This is pre-Minnesota territory even. And uh, throughout this map, it's one that's been studied greatly, but throughout this map, there are place names that are either actual attempts to capture um, indigenous names, and uh, to actually um, record those, or there are place names that are translations. For example, we have Bears Lake. This is a, a close-up of, of one of those, of, of part of that map. Um, we have Bears Lake here on the map. That is meant to be White Bear Lake. Uh, and there are a lot, of dis um, a lot of variations on how that came to be, why that came to be <coughs> as Bears Lake on the map. Uh, the fact that it is included on the map is in any way is significant. Uh, of course, we call it White Bear Lake today. And of course, we call Matamidai, Matamidai, um, which also means Mato, roughly meaning bear, Midai or Midai, meaning lake or water. Um, both mean Bear Lake or, or pieced together to become that, at least in some translations. The, um, 
there are a lot of discussions, and, and I have, frankly have a lot to learn about this particular map and what, it, what more it can tell us, because some of the sections are incredibly well detailed. Our area is a little less specific, and clearly not that they had the same surveyors' tools and things that they have today by any means, um, but clearly the shape is a little bit off. Uh, the lake has changed, but probably not quite that much uh, in its shape over the years. And, um, but the fact that we made it onto the map in the 1840s is fairly significant. This was a known place. This was a known and named place. And so that's, that's an important piece. Throughout this area are many of those um, known and named places. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, um, Minnesota as a whole in general, what we know today as Minnesota, was created through the heaving and the melting of glaciers, the formation of glaciers, uh, creating an assortment of land features, including, of course, our many rivers, our many lakes. We're well known for those lakes. Um, but also areas of rocky and sandy soil, areas of fertile soil for farming that were good for farming. Uh, Minnesota itself is a wonderful microcosm of exactly that, because you get the, the fields and the plains and the things to the south, and the rocky, sandy, um, challenging terrain in many ways to the north. Uh, and it's exactly those landscapes that attracted people through the centuries. It's still those landscapes that attract people. We are working to create a um, bike path around White Bear Lake. It's something that draws people. One of the goals of that is to bring people to the community and, and make it a place where people want to live because they want to be out by that lake and by that water. Uh, we have many sailors and fishing people and, and all sorts of other folks who come. Uh, and it was exactly that same way centuries ago, not necessarily from a recreational standpoint, but those features provided, um, provided amenities, provided food, provided resources. Uh, as we go throughout this three-part series, um, this is a theme that you will hear about again and again. Uh, with a thorough understanding of the land, the indigenous people made a seasonal migration through this region, uh, spending much of the winter season hunting and living in the more wooded areas and trapping and maple sugaring in the spring season. Villages were established in the warmer season and were often at known places and reused year after year. So it wasn't just a random migration. It was a, certainly a pattern. The Dakota and the Ojibwe who had migrated west from the, the Sault Ste. Marie area in the Schwamigan region near Lake Superior have lived together for generations in what would become Minnesota. As with any relational dynamic where two groups live in close proximity, things were not always peaceful. But both the Dakota and Ojibwe had a view of the land not as a possession, but as a living entity and treated the land as a relative or a being. The region just to the north of our area is often referred to as the middle ground a fluctuating area whose boundaries changed as the seasons and the conditions changed. So if food was scarce, that transitional space could shift to areas that had more resources. Um, if food was abundant, it might shift further south or further north. Uh, things became much more complex when European contact, contact brought a view of the boundaries and the land ownership, which were applied to this area and restricted people to remain within certain geographic locations. In other words, instead of having the freedom to sort of sort it out and make things flow, uh, different types of rules were applied and, and things got complicated quickly. The introduction of alliances between indigenous people and fur trade companies or indigenous people and military units occurred, which often created imbalances and ever-changing relationships. The dynamics changed and the friction between various groups increased creating complex relationships. And that's complex is one of the key words throughout all of these discussions uh, because things are never simple, just like within our own families, our own communities, neighborhoods, and that sort of thing. Uh, one physical link to the past that I have been uh, very aware of throughout my tenure at the Historical Society are the burial mounds at White Bear Lake. Uh, there were several burial mounds along Lake Avenue um, for many, many years, and today there's only one that remains. But the largest mound, most were, most were destroyed due to lack of understanding or lack of knowledge. Um, one was very specifically consciously taken out, uh, the largest mound that sat here. This mound was incredibly significant. It stood 84 feet um, long, or 80 to 84 feet long, and about 12 to 15 feet wide, uh, and, and was a very important site. It is often believed 
that mounds were generally, mound sites were generally built near village sites. And we do not know specifically of a village site around the Wiper area, and, and I'm not certain how close they were necessarily had to be. Um, but it intrigues me that we have a, a concentration of mounds along the shore of the west shore of the lake and a, not a known village site at this point um, in the near vicinity. So uh, it's one of those, again, pieces that we need to continue to try to understand. Um, the mounds, of course, were man-made. They're man-made physical link to our past. Uh, but there were many ways that the land itself, as I've said, can talk to us and share its story, and that, of course, of the humans who have inhabited it through the years. Uh, please don't eat the tree cookies. I know there's one group. I, I do need to use these again, and the teeth marks make it harder to use. Um, yeah, as Sarah said, I use uh, the tree cookie, and the tree cookie she's referring to is this one right here, which I implore all of you to come and at least come and touch and see and feel it. Uh, it's, it's very touch friendly. So please come and look at it. Um, with regards to history, this, when you touch this tree, you are touching carbon that was sequestered from the atmosphere uh, 250 years ago. Um, so when you touch this, you're touching a piece of the environment, quite literally, um, locked away in the, the wood of this tree. Um, so with that, let's go over here. Sorry, I'm a walker, so I'm not going to stay in one spot. So you're going to have to keep up with me. Um, so you might be asking why a science teacher is here talking about the history of the land. Well, uh, when I started teaching here at Matamidi High School uh, about seven years ago, uh, I, I was given the task of teaching environmental science. And environmental science is traditionally you talk about what people do. So you talk about power plants and energy and stuff like that. You're more or less told to tell the kids what they need to think. Uh, that's not how I roll. Uh, when I teach, I want to get my kids outside. I wanna, if I'm going to teach them environmental science, I want them to be in the environment that they are learning about. Um, so the number one thing that I did is I started something uh, called my tree project, um, where around the high school we have, uh, we are very great, grateful to have uh, for a couple of large woodlots with very large trees. And these kids, they grow up, and most of them grow up in Matamidi, and they walk by these trees every single day. And all they ever see is trees. They don't see the forest. And the goal of this project is to get them to change their paradigm from just a bunch of trees to be able to see it as a dynamic, historical uh, context of this living, breathing environment. Uh, so what I challenge them to do is to get outside in the dead of winter and identify trees, which how would most of us identify trees? With the leaves. So I say, we took all the leaves off. Now you have to tell me the difference between a bur oak and a white oak. Or, well, I don't tell them that. They figure that out. Um, so here they are. Quite, this was a couple years ago there. This is buckthorn, so that's, that's the one that they all learn very, very quickly. And then there they are engaging with the, the tree cookie there. Uh, this brings into the, the story of the grandmother oak here. It's a bur oak. Bur oak are the slowest growing of all of the oaks. So white oaks are fairly slow growing. Red oaks grow relatively quickly. But bur oaks are, they're the ancient ones. Uh, this particular oak was uh, approximately 260 years by my count. Um, it was located right on Moorhead Ave in Lake Ave in White Bear Lake. And the branch that you see here pointed right towards Manitou Island. So this is a very significant tree. Uh, it has a, quite a bit of history going back 260 years. That predates our nation. That predates our state. That predates any European people in this area. So that tree, if you think about it, a wayward squirrel that was burying an acorn for winter some 300-ish years ago, buried an acorn, forgot about it, and it turned into this tree. And that's, that's a story in and of itself. Um, the reason bur oaks are so slow growing is they are very um, drought resistant, so they, they, they put their time in growing slowly so that they can res re, uh, resist drought uh, fires. They're very fire resistant as well. They're also found in prairie savanna areas. So that tells you something about if there's a bur oak there, that probably wasn't a forest. It was more of an open area with grasses and probably an oak savanna type ecosystem. All right, now it is your turn. I would like you guys to take a look. Uh, this is the number one question that I ask for my students, and you would be surprised. So if you know the answer, don't shout it out. Um, 
which ring is the oldest? This is how I start my tree project because you have to get the first things first. And there's a, we have this ring here and we have this ring here. So which one is the oldest? The other thing I'd like you to do is everybody take your tree cookie at your table and everyone take a look. See if you can figure out, looking at the information on your tree cookie, which one is the oldest ring and which one is the newest ring. And if you think you know the answer, don't. Just shout it out. See if you can get other people's perspectives. Oh, did you guys not get a cookie? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Take another 10 seconds for your conversation. Okay, let's come back together here. Oh, they're excited. Sorry to ruin the fun. So does anybody think they have evidence to support their claim? Now, some of you are like, well, I just know it. But is there evidence in the tree cookie, either at your table or on the board, that you could use to support your claim of which ring is the oldest, this one or that one? Does anybody want to share? Sure, right in the back there. I taught younger kids science. <laughs> the outside Bowman Island moved the food up and down. So I'm thinking if it's on the outside, the center ring would be the oldest and it would move outward. Okay, so. I may have been wrong. I always use like Harlem. Based on, based on prior experience, there's this phloem and xylem. That's the, think of it as like the pipes that pump sugar and water up and down the tree. And that's on the outside of the tree. Okay. Does anybody have something physical that they can see on their tree cookie that might be able to infer? Sure, right up front. Well, the bark, the bark starts to split as the, as the branches or the trunk get larger, so I would think it would be the outside ring would be the oldest. Okay. So is there evidence on your cookie? Because that could mean that they're putting more wood on the inside and pushing everything out versus going on the out. The grooves. Spreading of the bark, I guess, would be an indication. Okay. Anybody else? There's an embedded branch in this one. Okay. So conceivably healed around the outside. So showing evidence that it moved now, is that showing that it grew out from the inside? Or it grew around it? From the outside. Okay. You guys just would so desperately want me to tell you the answer now. <laughs> yeah, over here. There's evidence of physical damage at one point that would come from the outside of the tree, and now it's in the middle. So. Okay. Yeah, and this, this might sound common, common sense to some of you, but this is a very real misconception. Uh, in some classes, up to half the class, they, they don't know. And it leads to this very interesting conversation for how does a tree actually grow? Because it's very counterintuitive. The, the correct answer is, you wait for it. <laughs> oh, we're going. It grows from the outside out. And so it's putting on, if you think about this in three dimensions, it's putting on a cone of new wood every single year. So the oldest ring is here and the newest ring is here. The tree's, the tree's only alive right on the outside. And that's, that's very counterintuitive to think about. Um, and all of the evidence that you supplied is, is valid evidence. I'd like to touch on the idea that the trees get, uh, the, the bark splits. What does a young tree look like? What does the bark look like on a young tree? It's smooth. As they get older, they get wrinkles. That, that, is, that is all tree bark is. It is the tree's skin. And as they get older, they show their age. They, they wrinkle their skin. Um, so, I mean, if you want to think about it that way, these trees really are our elders. 
And wrinkles are not a bad thing. They, they show character. <laughs> yeah. Good save, good save, OK. Um, so seven, 1758, by my count, that's roughly. Now, I don't know exactly where this cookie came from. If this cookie came from four or five feet off the ground, it could take an oak 25, 30 years just to get that high. Um, so that's my count, and it gets harder to count. Some of these, as I'm going to tell you in a moment, are really hard to count. Um, and then 2016 is the, the youngest one for this particular tree. There we go. What do you think this might represent? So we see there's kind of this like really tight banding right in here. There is a drought. That is a drought. That is a very infamous drought that some of you might remember. Maybe not remember, but you might have experienced. This is the Dust Bowl. This is the Dust Bowl of the 1920s into the 30s. And you can see that that, for us, as, as modern Minnesotans, that is a historical drought. Now, looking at this tree cookie, is there any other droughts that you can see? Yeah, you've got, this is, I believe this is in the neighborhood of the 60s, and then, then you have the droughts of the late 80s, early 90s, and here, there's a bigger one, though. Right here. So there's the dust bowls. This one right here is, this is, you know, 10, 10 years or something like that. This is about 25 years. And they are right next to each other. I am talking, you have to get a magnifying glass to see the, the rings. What happened there? Does anybody know? I didn't tell you a year. <laughs> this is one, this is pre-European settlement in Minnesota. And it's a pretty significant date. In uh, this year, it was known as the year without a summer in New England, where they had snow in the, the crops in July. Oh, one in the back. Might be related to some kind of volcanic There you go. This is the eruption of Tambora. Tambora is a volcano in the South Pacific. It's an equatorial volcano. Uh, and it erupted. It's a super volcano. So think Yellowstone. It erupted, and it literally changed the climate for 15, 20 years, to the point that there was snow in the summer. Uh, and you can see that recorded clear as day in, this, in these tree rings. And it, this tree was hurting. And if this tree was hurting, think about the people that lived on the land. What happened in 1820? Fort Snelling. Fort Snelling, the native population signed the agreement for Fort Snelling and then the subsequent land um, treaties for giving away their lands. And think about what, how that affected the native people. In 1815, if you had five years of really difficult years of hunting and survival, you're going to be a much more susceptible to some other group coming in and trying to take your things. So right there on this tree, we see the ecological history of the land, but we also can relate it to the history of the people on that land. And that right there is a story. There's another one here that I had to do some research for, and that's... Uh, where is it? Back in here, I believe. In 1790, there was another extraordinary drought. So that's back to back within about 30 years, two extraordinary droughts happening on this land um, in very short succession. Question. Yeah. Where is this tree from? It's from White Bear Lake. Right on, right was, it was right on Lake Ave, yep. So not too far from that big mound that Sarah was just talking about. Is this that furrow you were talking about? Yep, this is it. So there's a, a, a zoom in of the tambora just to show you kind of just how many rings are there. I mean, it is, it is a significant, significant event in this tree's life. And that goes all the way back to 1815. All right. So moving away from the tree cookie itself, um, thinking about trees. If we see trees only as a commodity, as only as a, a product for wood or for things like that, we're, we're missing the point in my mind, especially as an environmental science instructor. They record the local history of the land. If you can learn how to read a tree, it tells you its life story. If it's going to grow towards the light, right? So you can see the life history of a tree just by looking at its shape. Uh, they also maintain a very accurate record of climate data. And looking at tree rings, we can 
collect beams from old buildings and we can look at the tree rings from those beams. And we can go back thousands of years in some cases by finding preserved trees and bogs and such. And we can cross-reference the data with other tree rings. And they're also members of a dynamic community. And that brings me back to my tree project. When we walk by trees all too often, we see just the trees. We don't see that story of the land. We don't see the, the changes that, that that forest has continually made. So by looking at the types of trees and the ages of trees in a land, we can learn its story. And we can also predict its future. So here is my tree project. They are challenged, and this is no small undertaking, in the middle of winter, they are challenged to determine the density, distribution, age, and species diversity of a lo local woodlot. So they have to collect an immense amount of data. It takes them about a week just to figure out how to even survey for that t amount of data. Like, what are they going to do? How are they going to do it? Um, and then they have to tell the story of three stories. They have to tell the story of the land uh, based on their tree data. They have to tell the story of this individual tree using this tree data. And then they have to tell the story of the people and how the people have interacted with the land. And what they come to realize is that the tree serves as a historical reference for the people. But I also invite elders from the community, uh, Mayor Judd Marshall. I invite him into my, into my classroom so he tells his oral history of Matamidae. And it's that oral history that really strikes the students. And that's the piece that is lost if we talk about native communities. Most of their history was passed down orally. And the only remnants we have of that are whatever people wrote down or what's recorded through what we know about the actual physical history of the land. So there's uh, Mr. Jim Mayor Judd Marshall in my classroom. Um, this is probably, th this project about three quarters of the way through is where I always hear this from a student. Why don't we ever talk about this stuff? They always think Minnesota started like 1850. They go to the Washington County Historical Society and everything's 1850 and, and more recent. What happened to the previous 10,000 years? Why do we spend so much time on the 150 years? And every year, a student, they realize they're missing this whole history of Minnesota that we never talk about, because we spend so much time focusing on 1850 and on. So they realize that Minnesota certainly did not start in 1849, that these trees and this land has been around in its, whatever its current state is, as a result of 10,000 or 12,000 years worth of history. That 10,000, 12,000 is, is the reason there was about a mile of ice here about 12,000 years ago. It was like Antarctica. Um, and then looking at those trees to predict something about the future. Um, if we start looking at Matamidae as a community, how is our ecological community changing? And how is, the, how is the, the human community affecting that ecological change? So now my students are engaging with history. They're understanding the history of the land, the history of the people. But they're also engaging with the history um, of, of the, of the, community, the ecological community of which they are a part. So they are no longer seeing themselves as apart from the forest, but they are a part of and they are responsible for the structure of the forest as it stands. With that, I'd like to thank you for being such a good audience. There they are learning how to survey, survey trees. I do want to add, spend a couple of seconds if there are any questions about either the tree cookie, about the tree cookies on your tables, if you have any questions for me, because I do have to go back because I have more classes to teach. <laughs> Are the tree cookies on the table from uh, the same, from branches off the same other oak? No, these are from a red oak up in Forest Lake. So these are from a, a red oak. These, n different, different oak, that's bur oak, this is a red oak. Yep? I, I would love to start that conversation. I have my small teacher groups that I, I try to share with, but it's, it's, I think it's hard when you have, um, you have something that's irreplaceable like this. I d have talked to people at the University of Minnesota in the dendrochronology lab, and they can take high resolution pictures and they can record the tree rings and then make that digitally available. They actually have a project that's open access where you can see tree rings from all, a ton of bur oaks throughout uh, the Twin Cities area. That's one of the projects they're working on. I guess I'm thinking too of the diversity of people that are coming to the land and 
Yeah, there is, equity is, a, is the underlying tone of this project. It, it doesn't seem like it, it's there, but when you start looking at trees and the community and the diversity that's there and that they need that diversity, I definitely in my classroom I see that as an, equi an opportunity to talk about equity, but also an opportunity for students who might not have, find success in other ways as an access point to get in there. Um, but yeah, I opened this project with a, a TED talk all about equity. In the front here. It's my mom. <laughs> Hi, mom. Hi. <laughs> um, you point as, a, as the last tree ring on your diagram as being out here. Is it there or is it right here? This. So, yeah, this, it, if you look at your tree cookies, look at the bark. The bark actually has growth rings as well, and that bark is kind of the reflection of the tree cookie rings. The bark then falls off, just like our dead skin sloughs off. Um, the bark has tree rings as well. So the outermost ring on the wood is the oldest tree ring. The rest is just in the bark. I'm curious, how, uh, what age are your students? Uh, they're mostly s juniors and seniors, okay. so 16 to 18-ish. Okay. Maybe I have one more question? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Couple more questions then? <laughs> Around the corner. Well, Yeah, it looks kind of like a bison, I think. I think it looks like a bison. It looks <laughs> like a big pump, yeah. I don't know what kind of tree it was, but uh, I, I, my memory's not real good, but initially when it was taken down, I think someone did some dating on it or something. That would, I would, that'd be an interesting one to take a look at, because if it's an oak, then it's, it's got some stories to yeah, tell. I'm not sure. I mean, it's really kind of but, deteriorating because it's outside now, but, but it's yeah. still there. Mary Jane says it's a cottonwood. That would be my first guess with a tree of that size. Yeah. Cottonwoods, they live fast, die young. So a big, huge cottonwood, 80 years old. Yeah, I mean, any yeah. Any other questions? How was that tree removed, the bur oak? And, and who managed it, and where did it go? It fell, it fell down in a storm in June of 2016, and it was preserved very graciously. Um, and we were lucky enough to get a slice of a, of a tree. By whom? <laughs> it was our tree. Um, and it didn't really fall down because of the storm. We'd had a lot of rain. Now, as he indicated, it's a bur oak, and bur oaks have tap roots. They don't, not like other trees that spread their roots out this way, it had a big tap root. Tap, uh, tap root, I meant to say. In any event, the soil got so soft uh, where the tap root was that the wind pressure at the other side of the tree, which doesn't show in any photographs, but it was much bigger, a bigger spread on it, and it pulled that taproot right out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's why it went down. It was on a bank. On a bank. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the bur oaks, they, they say for every foot of tree you see above the ground, they have roots going down about that deep as well for bur oaks. In the back. Absolutely, that's a good segue for some shameless pro uh, propaganda for my class in February 21st. If you would like to uh, attend that, I will teach you how to read branches as well. Yeah, in the front, the red hat. Uh, why is this, these tree rings are dark brown where the insides are beige? Do these fade over time? Oh, that's the bark. But you said the tree ring was out there. Right, that's the bark, the bark ring. If you look at your tree cookies, the, the bark makes tree rings, so those, that's bark, bark rings. And then the, where the lighter starts, that's the actual wood from the tree itself. So 
these tree rings move this way, but these tree rings, like the, the, the newest bark ring would be on the closest side to the wood, whereas the oldest bark ring would be on the outside. So it's an inverse of the, the wood. The oldest ones slough off and fall off, but the newest ones are right on that cambium layer, so that, that layer where the tree's actually alive. All right. Thank you very much, and now to Rob. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my uh, legal name is Rob Thomas. I'm the executive director over at Lakeshore Players Theater uh, in White Bear Lake. Uh, but my spiritual name, given to me by my kunchi, Margaret Keto, is Wokiksuye uh, Yuhamani. And that means in Dakota, walks with memories. And she gave me this name after I began uh, conducting extensive research into my family's history. So my journey uh, to find out, and I thank you for allowing me to come today and share my family's story, uh, but my journey to find out more about my family started actually when I left Minnesota. After college, uh, I moved down to Florida. I left Minnesota, what our, my ancestors used to call uh, Minnesota Makoche, which means the land where the water reflects the sky uh, or the clouds. Uh, after college, I went down to uh, an internship and I was struck by how quickly I started to feel that disconnect between uh, myself and my family and the land that my family had been on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, and that uh, brought forth in me very suddenly uh, almost the need to figure out more about uh, the history and the culture uh, that I used to ignore and even worse at times pretend uh, didn't exist. Uh, because of my lighter complexion, uh, I could pretend when I was in school that I wasn't Native American. Uh, and people didn't know I was until they, my grandma came to conferences with me and then they all saw this little old Indian lady uh, with me dragging behind her. Uh, as a side note, my cousins call me the Windian because I look so white, the white Indian. Uh, but my grandmother was born on the uh, Santi Sioux tribe of Nebraska reservation. And uh, her, her family was one of the first Dakota families to return to Minnesota after their exile. Uh, that's all I really knew about my family history, and I uh, suddenly needed to know more. So after moving back to Minnesota, I began to contact some of the elders in my family and found out that they had started a good chunk of the research. Um, in a lot of Native American families, you'll hear that uh, in the 50s and the 60s, they just sort of pretended they weren't, and they tried to fit in with white culture because it was a lot harder to be a Native American. It was a lot easier to be white. Uh, you hear a lot of families that say, oh, we're Italian. We're not Native American. We're Italian. And kids don't even find out that they're Native American until later on. And they know nothing of their history. Well, my family, to combat that, had started doing some of this research. Uh, and uh, as did, very recently, uh, forward-thinking organizations like the Minnesota Historical Society, uh, which had started acknowledging uh, Minnesota's genocidal past, and were actually publishing books on it that didn't include the term the Sioux Uprising, which was the title of a book from the Historical Society Press in 1976. So it was called the Sioux Uprising, and then we started to learn a little more about it. We called it the um, Dakota Conflict. And now we're using the more correct term, uh, the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862, or as my family insists on calling it, the Dakota-U.S. War. Um, so I began visiting historical sites in the Gale Family Library at the Minnesota Historic, uh, History Center uh, so often that the staff started to know me by name and subject. They'd see me walk in and they'd get some things ready for me. Uh, I took a month one summer to visit each significant site of the Dakota-U.S. War, the Ramsey House, the Battle of Birch Coulee, uh, Fort Ridgely, Fort Snelling, Lac Qui Parle Mission, Lower Sioux Agency, Traverse to Sioux, all of these, uh, New Ulm, all of these incredible sites uh, where substantial history of my family took place. In fact, I'm going to share a quick story about my trip to New Ulm, if that's okay. Uh, just because I had heard rumors in my family that at one point in a Chinese restaurant, they said there was a plaque uh, that had something to do with the U.S. Dakota War, and uh, they said it had some some it had a strange writing on it, and but nobody could remember where it was, and nobody could find it. So I went to New Ulm one day, and I started going to all of the. I started at the Chinese restaurant uh, that no longer existed, and they had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, so I went over to their little museum they had, and talked. And someone there said, "Yeah, I think I heard something about that. Check. It's a, maybe a bank or an insurance company or something like that." 
So I went downtown and started going to each bank and insurance company and asking if I could go in their basement, which uh, <laughs> didn't, <laughs> didn't work well in some places and worked just, uh, can I get in the vault, please? No, no. So, uh, when I uh, walked into an office and a woman said, I know where that is, that's next door, in the basement next door. So she took me over and we went down in the basement and uh, sitting on the floor leaning against the original stone foundation of the building was a plaque that said, during the Indian massacre, this building was the refuge for the women and children. Powder with fuse was stored in the basement and it was intended to blow up the building should the Sioux gain possession of the town. <laughs> so that was a plaque that I uh, went and found and took a picture of, asked if I could have it, and they said no. Um, <laughs> thought I'd ask. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, I, and all, all along my journey, I was able to find great stories like that. Uh, in each and every stop. There was history at each stop I made. I took trips down to Santee, Nebraska, to the reservation, and took uh, recordings of all the oral history my elders could remember. As Sarah mentioned, there wasn't a lot of documented history. Uh, the Dakota didn't have a writing, even. They didn't have a language, uh, a written language, until the late 1800s when missionaries helped them started uh, translating some of that. Uh, I went on to South Dakota to visit my relatives in Crow Creek, in Flandreau, Pine Ridge, Rosebud, Sisseton, Wapaton, Standing Rock, and Yankton, uh, just trying to get as much information as I can. And uh, unfortunately, you hear a lot when you make these stops. Well, Uncle so-and-so could have told us more, but he's gone now. And Aunt so-and-so could have told us more, but she's gone now. Uh, so it became very important to me to start documenting uh, some of these histories that weren't written down anywhere and that, uh, unfortunately, as the elders started passing away, we started losing some of that history. Uh, that documented history combined with the oral history from my family members helped me to find out the following. My great-great-great-grandfather, uh, Maza Adidi, which means walks on iron, was born into Red Legs Band, uh, which was a division of the Wachpekute, uh, a village on the Minnesota River near present-day Mankato. Uh, he married a woman named Pajah Hiyayoin, uh, which is translated to, she radiates in her path like the sun. And they had several young children when Maza Adidi uh, went off to fight in the Dakota-U.S. War. Uh, when the war was inevitably lost, Maza Adidi was one of several hundred Dakota men uh, to be tried by military tribunal and sentenced to hang, his trial lasting less than three minutes according to the trial transcripts, which are still intact today at the Minnesota History Center. He was sentenced to death along with over 300 other men. His sentence was eventually commuted uh, to serving prison time in a stockade in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, 38 other men were not so lucky and were hanged in Mankato, Minnesota in the largest mass execution to take place on U.S. soil still to date. Um, and I'm going to share with you a couple of the trial transcripts. So you can hear just how short some of the trials were. Uh, this is the trial of somebody who uh, was sentenced to death, had his uh, sentence commuted, and ended up being pardoned in 1866. Uh, this was at Camp Sibley in Lower Sioux Agency, Minnesota. The witness said, I saw the defendant at, f at the fort and a new Olm with a gun, running about with other Indians. The Dakota said, I was at the fort, but not at New Olm. I didn't fire at anyone. I was at Wood Lake, but didn't fire. And then the next line is from the judge. The commission finds a prisoner guilty as charged. The prisoner is sentenced to hang by the neck until dead. And that's the full transcript. Another one, uh, Dakota. I didn't fire at the fort. I was there and got my arm broken before I could fire. The witness said, after the fight at the fort was over, I went down the hill near a spring with a mare I had taken out of the stables, and the prisoner told me to give it up, and I was afraid, and I gave it up. I saw him have a gun there. And then the next line is, the commission finds the prisoner guilty as charged. The prisoner is sentenced to hang by the neck until dead. Luckily, this person's sentence was also commuted. Um, sorry. This is the uh, trial transcript for somebody who was actually hanged in Mankato. I am not guilty. I have been in three battles. I have stolen horses, and I tell you I fired at white only I tell you I fired at white men only in battle. 
A witness, I heard him say to another Indian that Richardson was coming on horseback and they shot him off his horse and wounded him and then tried to get some news and after they got it, they shot him dead. The prisoner shot him, I heard him say so. And then this commission finds a prisoner guilty as charged. This prisoner is sentenced to hang by the neck until dead. Uh, so this is, this is literally the transcripts from the trial. These were the tribunals that took place. They were all incredibly short. Uh, most of the Dakotas didn't speak the language. They had intermediaries speaking for them. A lot of the witnesses were the same person. You'll see the names of the witnesses. Same person was a witness in a lot of the trials. So um, that was probably the most impactful thing to hear is just how quickly we were willing to um, perpetuate uh, Ramsey's, he, he said at one point, the, the, the Indians must be exterminated or driven from the borders of these lands, essentially. And, and we were willing to do that that way. Uh, Pajai Yayawin was forced march uh, from November 7th to November 13th in weather uh, similar to, to now with her three children, uh, some, other family, uh, some other family's children, and someone referred to as the old lady, and we don't know who that is, but she was traveling with her. Uh, they were marched 150 miles from the Lower Sioux Agency in Morton, Minnesota, uh, to the concentration camp built to hold them on the banks just below Fort Snelling. Uh, they marched them through the cities that battles had taken place and allowed the settlers to do to them as they pleased. And there are some graphic examples from the diary of a soldier that marched with, with them, uh, but I'll spare the details and just say over 200 of them died or were killed on the march and during their incarceration at Fort Snelling. Uh, amazingly, uh, my family survived, and despite uh, Mazadidi serving his sentence in Davenport, Iowa, he was sentenced to hang, but he had his sentence uh, c uh, commuted. And uh, Pajai Yayawin's transfer by riverboat to a reservation in North Dakota, they managed to find each other and finally settled in a newly created reservation on, in Santee, Nebraska. And that's where my grandmother was born. Um, in more recent history, as I said, her family was one of the first Dakota families to return to Minnesota, where it is still uh, legally, uh, it's, uh, Dakotas are still exiled. Uh, there's still a law on the books today that says that Dakotas cannot be uh, within the borders of Minnesota uh, that are tied to some treaty rights issues, so it's never been overturned. But it's actually a law that says that technically I can't be here today. Uh, her brother was one of the first, he was either the sixth or the eighth, I'm sorry, I can't remember, Native Americans to graduate from the University of Minnesota. Um, and why is this important and why do I like to share this story? Uh, all of it comes down to acknowledgement. Uh, when I go and I talk to people about my family history, uh, and when other people talk about their family history, they're not looking for pity, and they're not looking for you to take responsibility, or anyone to take responsibility, or my other side of the family to take responsibility for the atrocities committed and the genocide committed. All they're looking for, uh, in most cases, is a level of acknowledgement, because only after we acknowledge our genocidal past can the people who are affected by it heal. And when I say the people affected by it, I don't just mean people from the indigenous community. Everybody in Minnesota is affected by that. The Dakota had a deep connection with the land, and after they were exiled, uh, we lost a lot of that connection. We started to see the land as a um, commodity, as a resource, as opposed to a living thing that we live in harmony with. Um, and that's why it's important for me to share this story. Um, I'm happy now to answer any questions. I will say I don't consider myself a Native American historian. I've done a lot of history on my family and thus have, uh, have uh, gotten a lot of information about the Dakota and Minnesota. But if anyone has any questions, I'll certainly try to answer it for you. Yes, sir. He did. So they, uh, after several hundred men were sentenced to death, all of those death sentences were passed on to President Lincoln, and he had a group of people try to determine. Uh, there's an actual quote that says something to the effect of, "Not so, uh, kill not so many to be cruel, but also enough to, to make a point. And so at first they um, decided to try to hang anyone only who had committed uh, crimes of a sexual nature against women. And they only found two instances of that in all of, the, 
And they said, that's, that's not near enough. So instead, he commuted the sentence of everyone except for the people who had participated in battles that were not sanctioned. So if somebody raided a farmhouse and took the farmhouse outside of an official battle, then uh, they were sentenced to death and the rest were commuted. And yeah, that was, that was Abraham Lincoln. So while he, was, while he was working on freeing the slaves, he was also, um, some, some people think of him as a savior to save that many lives, and some people say, well, he could have done a lot more, but everybody makes that decision for themselves. Any other questions? Yes, Do you know anything about the settlements in this area? Oh. Not much. No, not much in this area. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, I actually wrote a play for the History Theater in St. Paul for their uh, Raw Stages series about this very thing. It was centered on those trial transcripts that had such an impact to me. Uh, so it was produced there twice. Was your grandfather, so your grandfather was Native American. Was your grandfather also Native American, or was that where the family uh, emerged? No, uh, my, gra yeah, my grandmother uh, married a, a, a European, a German man. So her... Her family above that was, was Native American. Uh, in fact, her grandfather, who was the son of Maza Adidi, who I was talking about, um, uh, as a protest, never spoke English again after, uh, after the conflict was over and after the exile. So he lived in the house with them. Uh, he was in a wheelchair a good portion of that time, and he just he never spoke English again. So all, all the business was conducted by somebody else, and he knew English, but he wouldn't speak it. Uh, they, they were in um, northeast Minneapolis. And then, well, they, they moved around a little bit. They were in northeast Minneapolis. They were on uh, Franklin Avenue, uh, where the 35W is now. They're, the building they lived in was torn down to build 35W. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of hours of it, and some of it is not, <laughs> has, some of it's about the dinner that one time that they had, but uh, it can be uh, pared down into, you know, some, some really great gems of oral history, and I would be happy to at some point. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be really interested to read it. Great. Any other questions? Um, it was a uh, seasonal migratory, part of the seasonal migratory pattern, so definitely Dakota people were here. We are not currently aware of descendants specifically of Dakotas who were here in this area, directly in this area, um, but that doesn't mean that we won't be able to find descendants or find resources. Um, and, and like we sort of talked about to begin with, um, the goal here in a couple of ways is that this is really the beginning, the starting of a conversation or the starting of um, trying to, uh, from the historical society perspective in particular, trying to uh, dig more deeply, if you will, um, figuratively, of course, not literally, um, but uh, to, to dive into things a bit more deeply uh, and how it impacts us in the present 
and how it will continue as we add layers and as we talk about different things and, and different changes and decisions that are being made um, throughout our community, throughout our state, and throughout our nation. Uh, but as a, um, you know, basically pulling it all together, because one of the conversations that we've had in, a, in the planning processes for this and, and several other things uh, has been, you know, this is huge, I mean, this is big. It's, it's big and it's complex, as I mentioned earlier. And so it's, it's the beginning. Um, if, if from our perspective anyway, uh, for this project. And it's multi-layered and it's not a point, it's not a one and done by any means. This, this conversation or this, this series or this session is not a one and done. And so the idea um, is that now we continue with the Dakota and the Ojibwe were the earliest people in this vicinity. Let's keep carrying that forward because they weren't just here and gone. And so as we add in the European settlers and some of the others who have come uh, through each different successive generation, how does that all work? How does that all work together? How, does it, how did it not work? Because in a lot of cases, there were challenges. And, and when you mix any group of folks, if any of you have ever lived in a college dorm, you know that when you mix people together, um, <laughs> things get interesting fast. Um, but that's that's a learning experience, and that's something that we want to be able to play with. So, um, so to to so yes, D Dakota most definitely were here. The Dakota were most definitely here. Was it at this point in your research kind of looked at it was more of a summer area or, or transitional for tribes? That's what you come up with at this point, rather than here was a village set. We don't know of a specific village site right here in in this vicinity, but there are village sites in the broader area in the, the Washington County and, and Anoka County area in particular. Um, and of course, down in St. Paul and Ramsey County and, and various pieces, and, and as you go further south in the cities as well. Um, it would have been, we know that there is oral tradition of maple sugaring on Manitou Island, so it a, a spring sort of activity, um, and certainly the opportunity to take advantage of some of the fishing and, and other things. The, there's There are references to the abund abundance of waterfowl, or not waterfowl so much, but the, um, the fish and the, the maple sugaring opportunities and that sort of thing. And in fact, the thought is that the tree cookie um, from the tree, the tree was significant as a marker tree, and, and Jim didn't really get into this piece of it so much, and I don't know how much background you have on that particular topic, but Mary Jane, I may have to pull you in. Uh, <laughs> but the, the tree is, is significant as a marker tree um, because the idea was that um, trees would be pierced and uh, manipulated so that the branches would point or signify specific paths or um, resources. So the tree sat on the shore of Lake Avenue, but it pointed out toward the island. And the thought is that that's where it was relatively shallow, um, a good crossing to the island, if you will, but not too far from the bridge, um, a shorter crossing. And of course, the island had the resources of the maple sugaring. And so, so there's absolute evidence. I mean, and, and the burial mountains are an irrefutable evidence that they're were people here for sure, um, and so it's just more, more and more to learn, uh, to dig and to learn and to try to find out what we can and what we can. Some of the untraditional resources, as I said, my training has always been through documents and maps and and things like that, and those stop. We hit the 1850. You know, Jim nailed it. It's you get back to 1850, and it's like, well, there's not a lot more. I mean, there, there's earlier stuff, but not a huge amount. But there are other resources that we can use to try to piece those pieces together. Are there any written records of interactions between Europeans and Native Americans? In Here? Yeah. Limited. There are some. There are some. Uh, not, not, a, not a huge amount, unfortunately. And, and yet it's one of those things that we've been having discussions internally about what is out there that we're not seeing that way. You know, what, what is out there that's been dismissed as not being Native American, but really if you go back and you look, there are a lot of hints or a lot of, you know, maybe not blatant, we saw this person this day, um, but it's, uh, there are clues as to what was going on or, or physical um, references to physical evidence that was left or that was um, removed or whatever, absolutely. So again, just more of an awareness of that even is, is critical as we go. So was there a question up here? Did I see a hand up this way? Uh, you talked about the mounds um, along the, the shore there and the, they, one was moved or destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, were any of them actually uh, moved or 
we're in, in within the era of the, the is there any left or what? And we're, is anything in the era of the of preservation where the community want to preserve anything? Other, or otherwise, are they just a little bit? There, so there were um, as many as 10 mounds along Lake Avenue kind of between the highway and, and Clark Avenue. At one point, the largest mound, which I pointed out, um, was actually removed in 1889, the spring of 1889. Uh, it had been, um, there had been a movement to remove it for a few years because for a variety of reasons, uh, just like anything else, I guess, but um, there was a, a sense that it was blocking the road along Lake Avenue, it was in the way. Uh, people wanted to remove it for that. There was there are stories that one of the business owners in town felt it was blocking the view of his resort hotel, so he wanted it gone. Um, and there are other aspects. The, the ultimate piece, the final piece, was that that sort of pushed it to the edge. Was that um, in 1887 there was a there was a carriage accident. There was a horse-drawn carriage that was passing the mound, and the horse spooked. And ultimately, the carriage was overturned. Uh, one of the riders, one of the passengers, died. His head hit a tree when the carriage overturned. Uh, and the remaining family members and, and the passenger uh, decided to sue the village for negligence or for liability for leaving the mound there. Um, it's, yeah, exactly. Um, it took a couple of years. The, there were lawsuits that were brought and then dropped and then rebrought by various members of the family and different things. Ultimately, the lawsuit didn't prevail. The lawsuit was thrown out. But it was that fear that the village at the time, it was the village of White Bear, a very young village of White Bear, uh, that they, it was a liability. That was the concern. And so the plan was drawn up to actually remove the mound, the biggest mound, physically remove the biggest mound purposely at that point. Um, there were supposed to be a number of precautions taken, a number of protections um, where items from the mound were not to be removed, they were, they were to be gathered and protected. And uh, unfortunately, um, the mound was essentially looted, and so a lot of items were lost. But there were two boxes of grave goods or items that were buried within the mound, within, with the human remains that were taken and transferred to the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, and those are still at the State Archaeologist's Office at the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, in addition to that, the majority of 19 skeletons, human remains, were um, also gathered together and put on a boxcar, put on a train, and sent down to St. Paul to the Minnesota Historical Society. And effectively, the Historical Society said, we don't take human remains. We, we will take the, the goods, but we were the box, but we won't take human remains. And so those remains were actually sent back to the community and they were reburied at um, Union Cemetery, which is a cemetery right off of Highway 96 by Highway 61 there, uh, and were reburied in a mass grave in the corner um, at Union Cemetery. So you can go there. It is marked. Uh, it took a century to get a marker put on it. Uh, <laughs> but it is marked now, and you can find it um, and pay respects and, and uh, go there. But um, it, was a, it was very much a controversial issue at the time. The, the general movement was remove the mound, but um, from, from, from a quite a bit of a standpoint, but there were people who stood up against it. Um, my, actually, my great-great-grandfather owned the property where the mound was and fought against the removal at the time. And I'd like to think that he was well ahead of his time, um, the beliefs of the time, if you will. Uh, and and um, you know, his respect for life was at a certain level, regardless of whose life it was. Uh, and, and I may be biased, I'm clearly biased, but um, I, he, was, he had previously been an Episcopalian minister, and so I think that, that the fact that life was sacred was important to him. Um, and he actually filed a court injunction to stop the village from the removal and, and ultimately was lost that attempt. But yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the cemetery would have been owned by William Weber, a farmer named William Weber, and, and I think he did, um, William Weber, I think, did step up and say, do, let's do this. It was a logical 
option. It was, and it was near the mound sites. It wasn't far. It was just across the highway, across the railroad tracks. Uh, the family story is that um, two of the, the remains, two sets of remains, were actually reburied on the property, the family property, um, because my great-great-grandfather supposedly and allegedly insisted that that happen. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way to verify that other than attempting to unearth those remains again and see what, rem what remains. So um, it's, it's an interesting piece. What is the approximate age of the mounds around Lake Bear Lake? I've heard a lot of estimates and without really being able to, I mean, they're, they're basically guesses without really being able to study, but the, the closest date or the most common date I hear applied is about 1750. Um, then that brings a question. Father Hennepin already mm -hmm. was in this area, you know, as of 15, whatever, as you would call it, Dakota. Weren't they pretty much brought into the Christian religion? And aren't those mounds, by speculation of what I've read, those mounds have to be older than just the Dakota mm -hmm. when they came to Minnesota. The mounds have to predate the Sioux arrival in Minnesota by at least over a hundred years because of when Christianity came to Minnesota, the mounds no longer were built. As far as my history has gone, yeah. the mounds pretty much discontinued when Christianity entered the state of Minnesota by either Hennepin or further back. Yeah, I, I, and you can certainly speak to that. Um, as I would say that the stories are not always hard and fast. Yeah, actually, <laughs> in my research, I found the documents of my uh, uh, Pajahi Iowines. Her conversion and baptism happened at Fort Snelling when she was detained. Uh, so she was given a Christian name then. Uh, but before that, they didn't practice the Christian. They At least that group didn't mm -hmm. practice the Christian religion. Uh, so it was, it was after her internment, and then she maintained that Christianity, brought it to her family when they came back together again, and then uh, raised their, their kids Christian. Understandable, yeah. but we're talking about the age of the mom. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I don't Most think, I mean, I, 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 I absolutely hear what you're saying. I think, um, I think that Father Hennepin was here at a certain point in time, and, and other, many others, um, certainly missionaries and others. Uh, I don't believe Personally, and I, I think there are a number of schools of thought on this, so this is my personal feeling, uh, that everyone conformed to those changes by any means. Um, and I think that, as you talked about your ancestor who refused to speak English, um, people had various ways. And, and mound building is a little more complicated than taking a personal stance on something, but, well, yeah. Well, being the Sioux, according to history, came into Minnesota roughly in the mid-1600s, along with the Chippewa from the East Coast. Many of those mounds were already there. Minnesota had over 12,000 mounds in its borders mm -hmm. at that point in time. I, as an historian, grew up in the area of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I have seen the sign we saw. <laughs> My ancestors were in the battles of mm -hmm. the Dakota War through New Orleans, Fort Ridgely, in that area. The land I still own is one of the tracks where the Indians were marched through mm -hmm. to come to Fort Ridgely. Uh, I have studied this with my grandparents sure. who are both gone for well over 50 years. Sure. I have, uh, I'm quite knowledgeable. I put on seminars already on just the Dakota Fort. So my understanding of the mounds in the area are well before the Sioux and Chippewa entered the state of Minnesota. Many of them were there by the Woodland Indians and other mm -hmm. Indians that were, pardon my expression of Native American, they called them. A lot of the mounds Before were not the yeah. Dakota entered the state of Minnesota. They were more of a ceremonial mm -hmm. I had area. Mm -hmm. Many of those mm -hmm. mounds had been and around, around the New Orleans area, the state of Minnesota, where laws you can not touch a mound any longer, mm -hmm. and back mm -hmm. many, many village 60s in that mm -hmm. area. So I uh, most personally have pottery, pottery Kelsey people at mm -hmm. that point before they found the area. Absolutely, and grave goods and things, I mean, because that was very much part of the tradition. Because of mm -hmm. Christianity coming into Minnesota, most of the Native Americans 
on the plains were built or they were buried in what they call a stone monument. Maybe you're familiar with that, above ground. Later on, they were, they were uh, buried similar to the regular burials, and those bounds or, or burial places are around uh, Morton, uh, down there, you know where the Lower Indian Reservation was? Lower Sioux. Yeah, Lower Sioux. And uh, pretty much in that way, they were still buried the normal the way the white man was buried. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. Yeah. I was just curious if anything was done with the mounds in the White Bear area of their age. Specifically, not necessarily, uh, not, not at this point. I know there have been conversations with the um, State Archaeologist's Office about some of the LIDAR technology and other scanning technologies and things that can help date certain, without being as intrusive, obviously, as an, as an excavation would be or that type of thing. Um, and essentially, there are different schools of thought because there are, the jury is out, if you will, um, on a lot of that and, and the dating of certain areas uh, and, and depending on the patterns and the, the living pieces. So, um, all right, I think we're winding down uh, and, and getting close to the end of our time together today. Thank you, Rob, for sharing your story. I'm gonna give you a shameless, yeah. <laughs> a shameless plug, Rob is willing to share more of his story, an expanded version of what you heard today through a presentation uh, being held at Lakeshore Players. It's on your sheet here on February 25th um, called Touching the Earth of Our Ancestors. And so you can dig in uh, even more in depth. Uh, and as I, as I have said several times this morning, um, the goal is that this is a starting point and a, a something that we hope to continue as conversations of the community uh, and, and continue to learn, continue to piece together new information. Uh, and so in that regard, we actually have Deb Barnes uh, up front here, uh, if Deb wants to wave. She's sort of recording the sessions, if you will, um, and, and kind of encapsulating what we're, the conversations we are having and the presentations we are having uh, as we go and, and trying to keep a record of that. Uh, and she is doing so on behalf of the Greater uh, White Bear Lake Community Foundation, um, who is Executive Director Jackie Reese is here with us today. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Jackie's also been part of the steering committee and, and helping pull these pieces together and these presentations together. So um, I don't think we have anything other um, at this point other than the fact that, as Jordan mentioned earlier, she is willing to do uh, saging or smudging as we um, exit tonight. Um, So if you couldn't hear Meg, if you did have to park in the back, uh, if you're in the back lot here, you can get out that way through the doors. So, but all right, thank you all for coming out this morning. We appreciate your wonderful attention.